Here we are with another glimpse of the toughness of hobbits. One would think they would quietly trudge along, trying to find a place to get a drink, perhaps find a place to hide and rest so they can recover from the ordeal. But instead, they talk lightly. As Tolkien puts it in the prologue, hobbits could survive rough handling by grief, foe, or weather in a way that astonished those who did not know them well. Hello everybody, welcome to Out in Suleva, where we are walking our way through Tolkien's Legendarium, looking for new insights to the books that we all love. Today, we are going through part three of chapter three of book four, the Uruk High. As we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, grab a version of the books you don't have in the description below, or join the channel membership community if you'd like to support the channel that way. We also partner with Chapters Tea and Coffee. Chapters spring from a passion for story. They set out to elevate the stories we all love by teaming up with independent artists to hand draw beautiful imagery and pair it with specially selected artisanal tea. My favorite is Second Breakfast, obviously. Go to drinkchapters.com slash Hurin and use code Hurin15 to get 15% off. I do earn small commission from every bag sold, so thank you in advance. It's a great way to sit down and enjoy the books we all love. That's drinkchapters.com slash Huron and use code Huron15 to get 15% off. All right, let's dive in. We come back to our intrepid pranksters back on the move in the careful, loving hands of the orcs. The Isengarders seized Merry and Pippin again and slung them on their backs. Then the troops started off. Hour after hour, they ran, pausing now and again only to sling the hobbits to fresh carriers. Either because they were quicker and hardier or because of some plan of Grishnak's, the Isengarders gradually passed through the Orcs of Mordor and Grishnak's folk closed in behind. Soon they were gaining also on the Northerners ahead. The forest began to draw near. Pippin was bruised and torn. His aching head was grated by the filthy jowl and hairy ear of the Orc that held him. Immediately in front were bowed backs and tough, thick legs going up and down, up and down, unresting, as if they were made of wire and horn beating out the nightmare seconds of an endless time. Starting at the second half of the section, we see the nightmare of captivity continue for Pippin, hour after hour, not only running from the day before, but now he's crushed in the arms of an orc. Clearly not a very soft way of carrying him either. I can imagine it's relatively bouncy, every step almost giving him whiplash, his head already aching, it's just getting worse and worse with every step. There's nothing pleasant to see, just orc legs pounding out a rhythm of his aching head and time passes. Now, I can't comment very much, if at all, about the plan of Grishnak because I don't really see it doing anything in this whole chapter. We'll see Grishnak show up again in another page or two, but none of this interaction, none of his interaction with Ugluk or the Hobbits has anything to do with the Mordor Orcs falling behind. The only thing I can really think of is it truly is because the Isengard Orcs were quicker and hardier, and that will probably have a lot to do with the fact that they don't have the same adverse effects from the sun. The Moria orcs were not quite as lucky. In the afternoon, Ugluk's troop overtook the northerners. They were flagging in the rays of the bright sun. Winter sun shining in a pale, cool sky though it was. Their heads were down and their tongues lolling out. Maggots, jeered the Isengarders. You're cooked. The Whiteskins will catch you and eat you. They're coming. First thing to know is the word sun is not capitalized. As I'm writing this, I'm struck by a thought. Maybe I'll do the actual research on this later, but maybe the sun is only capitalized when someone is talking and referencing the sun in dialogue. Not always, but only in those instances? I don't know. It could be a correlation between who's speaking too. Maybe it's just the more like noble-blooded that capitalize the sun because they know who the sun really is. Anyway, that's not exactly why I'm bringing up the sun in general. We're seeing the Moria Orcs or the Northerners really struggling in the sunlight. Now, I couldn't exactly figure out why the Orcs hate the sunlight. Rather, the sun weakens them. So we see the jeering from the Isengarders actually giving us some interesting insights. How could Ugluk and his followers stand the sun? Well, we'll hear Treebeard mention it in the next chapter, but it's generally accepted that Saruman somehow interbred Orcs and men. Merry or Pippin mentioned it in the Scouring of the Shire that some of the ruffians look like people they saw in Isengard. So the Isengard orcs can run in the sun and it doesn't affect them, at least like not as much. But sun or no sun, once they see Aramur's riders are catching up to them and incre they increase their speed to get to the forest before the cavalry of the Rohirrim can catch them. But no, the riders draw level with them and hem them in with the river. We would think this would give the hobbits some hope. Maybe they could be rescued by these riders. But Pippin's train of thought takes him a completely different direction. He wondered very much what kind of folk they were. He wished now that he had learned more in Rivendell and looked more at maps and things. 
but in those days the plans for the journey seemed to be in more competent hands, and he had never reckoned with being cut off from Gandalf, or from Strider, and even from Frodo. All that he could remember about Rohan was that Gandalf's horse, Shadowfax, had come from that land. That sounded hopeful as far as it went, but how will they know that we are not orcs, he thought. I don't suppose they've ever heard of hobbits down here. I suppose I ought to be glad that the beastly orcs look like being destroyed, but I would rather be saved myself. The chances were that he and Merry would be killed together with their captors, before ever the men of Rohan were aware of them. Here the epistemic regime of the Lord of the Rings rears its head again. We normally hear the story from the least knowledgeable person's point of view, and we know Pippin didn't spend much time learning while in Rivendell. But due to Tolkien's interlacing, we have a bit of a better idea than Pippin, anyway. We got to meet Eomer. We know the strength of his character and how he trusted Aragorn. We know the riders didn't see any bodies that weren't orcs. And I think we, as readers, have plenty of hope the hobbits weren't killed and were simply overlooked in the battle. Not to mention, you know, the prologue says they're alive. He does get a small boost of hope, which is quickly squashed by thoughts of getting killed before the riders can even figure out what they are. Luckily, hobbits are dowdy at bay. Though the hobbits are hanging in there, they clearly can't do anything about their current situation. The orcs almost reached the forest with their captives. Night came down without the orcs closing in for battle. Many orcs had fallen, but fully 200 remained. In the early darkness, the orcs came to a hillock. The eaves of the forest were very near, probably no more than three furlongs away, but they could go no further. The horsemen had encircled them. A small band disobeyed Ugluk's command and ran on towards the forest. Only three returned. So the riders are harassing the orcs during the run and end up getting them surrounded before they can reach the forest. Only three furlongs they are. A furlong is about an eighth of a mile or 220 yards, so they're 660 yards away from the forest. And I think this is a tactical choice by the riders rather than just kind of a side effect of when they caught them. They can have some riders in the forest out of sight to patrol and even provide a little bit of, yeah, call it psychological warfare. It has to be pretty demoralizing to see a group of your, we'll say, friends try to make it out of the trap and only have three of them come back. Now, we're really getting to the meat and potatoes of this section. Ugluk orders the hobbits to have their legs tied up. The last part of the order was carried out mercilessly but Pippin found that for the first time he was close to Merry. The orcs were making a great deal of noise, shouting and clashing their weapons, and the hobbits managed to whisper together for a while. I don't think much of this, said Merry. I feel nearly done in. Don't think I could crawl away far, even if I was free. Lembus, whispered Pippin, Lembus, I've got some, have you? I don't think they've taken anything but our swords. Yes, I had a packet in my pocket, answered Merry, but it must be battered to crumbs. Anyway, I can't put my mouth in my pocket. You won't have to. I've but just then a savage kicked warned Pippin that the noise had died down and the guards were watchful. Mary and Pippin finally get a chance to actually chat some, which is nice. And we can see Mary is just about at the end of his good natured optimism. He's running out of hope. Remember, a few pages ago, Pippin was able to cut the bonds while tying his hands and retie them in the loose knot so he has some movement, dexterity, whatever. So he still has hope that they'll be able to do something. Mary obviously does not know this. And as far as I can tell, there are two different readings for how Mary reacts to Pippin's revelation of Lembus. One, we can take the normal hobbitry route and see Mary just continually joking, even though it seems they're about to die when, you know, the Rohirrim finally attack the orcs. The other way is to read it as Mary actually like snapping at Pippin for his stupidity. Maybe something more exasperated uh, and angry than anything else. I have Kind of a hard time thinking it's completely the second one, but I also can, like, I can't see it being completely good nature at this point, especially since he doesn't know about Pippin's hands being free. So I can understand him being, I don't know, call it a little ornery at this point. And if we see this as Mary really starting to lose hope, Pippin getting interrupted with a swift kick is like agonizing. Pippin has the words to give Mary hope and like bring his friend back from the brink of despair, and he's silenced. If you didn't already know, these orcs are total jerks. Okay, so night falls and Ugluk lets us know the riders are waiting until daylight to really attack, even though they can see really well in the night for at least for humans. Now, I don't know how much time passed, at least enough for the moon to move behind some clouds. My guess is quite a bit of time passed. I don't know if you ever watched the movie, We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson, and I think it was Josh Hartnett. I didn't bother looking it up. They're in Vietnam at a small camp and the sentries are at the edge of the camp watching for an attack. Well into the night, I think it was possibly like an hour or two before dawn, the Viet Cong finally attack, right when the sentries are losing their focus on the watch. Well, that's kind of how I imagine what the riders did here. They rode in relatively close, got off the horse, and just kind of killed a couple orcs at the edge of the camp, and they just fade away. Smoke bomb. 
Everybody gets that archer reference. Cool. This is where we get to pick up with Merry and Pippin. Pippin and Merry sat up. Their guards, Isengarders, had gone with Ublu. But if the hobbits had any thought of escape, it was soon dashed. A long, hairy arm took each of them by the neck and drew them close together. Dimly, they were aware of Grishnak's great head and hideous face between them. His foul breath was on their cheeks. He began to paw them and feel them. Pippin shuddered as hard, cold fingers groped down his back. While Ugluk and the other Isengarders are bad enough, I feel like this is the worst case scenario for the hobbits. Remember, Grishnak is the only orc voice Pippin described as evil. Ugluk at least was singularly focused about just getting the hobbits to Isengard. And he didn't do anything like overtly cruel, at least by orcish standards. But Grishnak, man, why is he searching the hobbits? And here we get another moment of fate intervening, at least my opinion. The thought came suddenly into Pippin's mind as if caught direct from the urgent thought of his enemy. Grishnak knows about the ring, he's looking for it. While Ugluk is busy, he probably wants it for himself. Cold fear was in Pippin's heart, yet at the same time he was wondering what use he could make of Grif Grishnak's desire. I don't think you'll find it that way, he whispered. It isn't easy to find. Find it, said Grishnak. His fingers stopped crawling and gripped Pippin's shoulders. Find what? What are you talking about, little one? For a moment, Pippin was silent. Then suddenly in the darkness, he made a noise in his throat. Gollum, gollum. Nothing, my precious, he added. Now, right here, this is a 9,000 IQ play by Pippin. Or if we stick to the pattern I've been noticing on this read through by Eru himself, is the phrasing that really catches me as if direct from the urgent thought of his enemy. Now, I'm well aware that Pippin has been hearing the orcs talk and hearing Ugluk saying the hobbits are to be unspoiled, meaning, you know, nothing stolen from them. And even just a page or two ago, he mentioned they didn't take anything but their swords. So I guess it's possible for the puzzle pieces to finally snap together after a couple of nightmare da days of endless running. But with all the references to luck throughout this book and the hobbit, I have a hard time really believing that Tolkien isn't giving us a little hint that Eru is pulling the strings in the background. If you think I'm wrong, let me know in the comments, at least nicely. But what is Pippin ultimately doing here? He's pretending to be Gollum and is leading Grishnak to believe he has the ring. That's clearly the whole point of capturing the hobbits and not plundering everything they have on them. And the whole exchange with them is super interesting. Grishnak is initially taken aback by Pippin's little outburst. It's almost as if he's too excited to believe his luck. He's double checking with Pippin to see if he's really referencing what Grishnak wants him to be referencing. And here I get a little bit like extra curious. How did Pippin, like how was Pippin doing the Gollum noises? How does that tip Grishnak off? He seemed to know a lot more than he should have really the whole time. Is he like a higher ranking orc than we like initially thought? Dunno, but my new theory is that he was there as Gollum was being tortured by Sauron and is like the captain of some sort of like special ops unit that, at least when not out on assignment, is near Sauron. Otherwise, Pippin saying Gollum doesn't really mean anything to him. Or maybe the description, including the weird noises of Gollum, circulated through the Mordor orcs as Sauron let him escape so they would not stop him or at least release him if they did catch him like accidentally. Their back and forth ends with Grishnak becoming so annoyed and frustrated with them trying to make demands of untying their legs, and he just like grabs them both and tries to bolt. They felt the orc's arms trembling violently. Curse you, you filthy little vermin, he hissed. Untie your legs? I'll untie every string in your bodies. Do you think I can't search you to the bones? Search you. I'll cut you both to quivering shreds. I don't need the help of your legs to get you away and have you all to myself. Suddenly he sees them. The strength in his long arms and shoulders was terrifying. He tucked them one under each armpit and crushed them fiercely to his sides. A great stifling hand was clapped over each of their mouths. Then he sprang forward, stooping low. Quickly and silently he went until he came to the edge of the knoll. There, choosing a gap between the watchers, he passed like an evil shadow out into the night down the slope and away westward towards the river that flowed out of the forest. In that direction, there was a wide open space with only one fire. At that very moment, the dark form of a rider loomed up right in front of him. A horse snorted and reared. A man called out. Grishnak flung himself onto the ground flat, dragging the hobbits under him. Then he drew his sword. No doubt he meant to kill his captives rather than allow them to escape or to be rescued. But it was his undoing. The sword rang faintly and glinted a little in the light of the fire away to his left. An arrow came whistling out of the gloom. It was aimed with skill, or guided by fate, and it pierced his right hand. He dropped the sword and shrieked. 
There was a quick beat of hoofs, and even as Grishnak leaped up and ran, he was ridden down and a spear passed through him. He gave a hideous, shivering cry and lay still. I know that this was a bit of a longer section, but I thought it was important to really get the full picture. The hobbits probably got so excited as they speak with Grishnak, they can feel his fingers trembling with eagerness to take the prize back to Sauron. He just needs to untie their legs so they can make a run for it. But it switches to terror as he lifts them up and starts moving away. They were so close, like all the hope they had just slips right away. I could like just see the spark in their eyes flicker as the rider spots Grishnak and just as quickly fade as the blade comes out ready to kill them. Once more, the hand of Iluvatar comes down and nudges things along just the right way. His blade rings and glinted and an arrow finds its mark. Now, I don't know how I missed this, but it literally says in the text that the arrow might have been guided by fate. I'm not sure it could even be more clear, but Tolkien does give us a little bit of ambiguity here. Aimed with skill or guided by fate. So maybe we can't ascribe everything to fate. Maybe this last piece of luck was just skill on the part of the riders. But either way, it left the hobbits laying on the ground. A horse and rider jump over them, but they're not seen because they are lying covered in their elven cloaks. Those cloaks provided as much protection, albeit in a different way, as Frodo's mithril coat. And their luck honestly just keeps going. They're sitting where they were dropped, wondering how they're gonna escape when a completely different group of orcs comes to try and help Ugluk and the company of his orcs. Then suddenly, the answering cries of orc voices came from the right, outside the circle of watchfires, from the direction of the forest and the mountains. Mauhur had apparently arrived and was attacking the besiegers. There was the sound of galloping horses. The riders were drawing in their ring close around the knoll, risking the orc arrows, so as to prevent any sorties. While a company rode off to deal with the newcomers, suddenly Merry and Pippin realized that without moving, they were now outside the circle. There was nothing between them and escape. So not only do their cloaks keep them from being mistaken for tiny orcs and killed by the Rohirrim, they stay hidden as the riders move in and leave them outside of their circle. This is obviously massive because now they don't even need to try and sneak past anybody. Even though hobbits are essentially silent when they want to be, Human eyes are set up in a way that uh, like motion, especially kind of in the periphery, like whoo, draws your attention. As close as they are to the forest, they're still in the middle of a plane, so it's not like they can skirt between trees or anything like that. So as long as they can move away quietly, there's essentially no chance of them being spotted. But in true Hobbit fashion, they do need to eat first. He slipped the cords off his wrist and fished out a packet. The cakes were broken, but good, still in their leaf wrappings. The Hobbits each ate two or three apiece. The taste brought back to them the memory of fair faces and laughter and wholesome food and quiet days now far away. For a while they ate thoughtfully, sitting in the dark, heedless of the cries and sounds of battle nearby. Pippin was the first to come back to the present. It might seem weird to sit down and eat when you're still so close to the fight, but the only times we've heard about them having anything to eat was when they were given their medicine and then a day or so when they got another drink of the orc liquor. And as we'll see a lot more in the books, mostly with Frodo and Sam, Lemus is pretty great for weary travelers. So after they eat, they decide to crawl to give their legs a chance to recover from all the abuse and then being tied and lying still for most of the night. As the blood gets flowing better in their legs, they decide they need to get to cover and get a drink. So they start their walk up the river. They turn and walk side by side, slowly along the line of the river. Behind them, the light grew in the east. As they walked, they compared notes, talking lightly in Hobbit fashion of the things that had happened since their capture. No listener would have guessed from their words that they had suffered cruelly and been in dire peril, going without hope towards torment and death, or that even now, as they knew well, they had little chance of ever finding friend or safety again. You seem to have been doing well, Master Took, said Mary. You will get almost a chapter in old Bill Bull's book if ever I get a chance to report to him. Good work, especially guessing that hairy villain's little game and playing up to him. But I wonder if anyone will ever pick up your trail and find that brooch. I should hate to lose mine, but I am afraid yours is gone for good. I shall have to brush up my toes if I'm to get level with you. Indeed, Cousin Brandybuck is going in front now. This is where he comes in. I don't suppose you have much notion where we are, but I spent my time in Rivendell rather better. We are walking west along the Entwash. The butt end of the Misty Mountains is in front and Fangorn Forest. Here we are with another glimpse of the toughness of hobbits. One would think they would quietly trudge along trying to find a place to get a drink perhaps find a place to hide and rest so they can recover from the ordeal. But instead, they talk lightly. As Tolkien puts it in the prologue, hobbits could survive rough handling by grief, foe, or weather in a way that astonished those who did not know them well. So on they go, lighthearted as can be. And luckily for Pippin, Merry is a bit more of a 
learned hobbit. He spent some time in Rivendell looking at the maps, curious as to where they could end up. So he has a better idea of where they are and what's before them, and he can at least know what direction to go to not just be wandering into complete wilderness, though that's not exactly how it, you know, works out for them. They just need to keep going into the forest for now and stay away from the battle behind them. As they walk, dawn comes, and with the dawn, the riders of Rohan charge the orcs. The hobbits turn to watch. Merry finally comes to himself, and we get our final passage of the video. We have watched too long, said Merry. There's Ugluk. I don't want to meet him again. The hobbits turn and fled deep into the shadows of the wood. So it was that they did not see the last stand when Ugluk was overtaken and brought to bay at the very edge of Fangorn. There he was slain at last by Eomer, the third marshal of the mark, who dismounted and fought him sword to sword. And over the wide fields, the keen-eyed riders hunted down the few orcs that had escaped and still had strength to fly. Then when they had laid their fallen comrades in a mound and had sung their praises, the riders made a great fire and scattered the ashes of their enemies. So ended the raid, and no news of it came ever back either to Mordor or to Isengard. But the smoke of the burning rose high to heaven and was seen by many watchful eyes. So the hobbits have been avenged, though unknowingly, by Eomer and his Eorid. I'm not entirely sure what Tolkien means when he talks about the watchful eyes. I'm assuming it's talking about Saruman, but it could also be talking about Treebeard, and that maybe could be what brings him to the spot where he meets the hobbits. Or I guess it could even be Gandalf, or maybe the Nazgul across the river, but he it says that Isengard and Mordor never heard back, so probably not that. Not sure if the distances for any of that makes sense. I don't really know. I have no real answer, but I'm going to try and see if anything is said, try to remember at least to see if anything is said about that later. We're always learning more and more every time we go through the book, and I just love this so much. And that brings us to the end of this chapter and the end of this video. So thank you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe, buy a new version of the book you don't already have in the description, or join the channel membership, and don't forget to claim your 15% off chapters tea and coffee. The book and these videos are best enjoyed with a lovely beverage on hand. And until next time, always remember, out in Tulipa, they shall come again. <laughs>